So Hess's law is something that we already talked about last time. We said if you have a balanced reaction that is transferring energy between the reaction and the surroundings, either the reaction is absorbing energy or releasing energy into the surroundings, if I look at that balanced reaction and I've got my reactants and my products, if I multiply that, then I will multiply the energy exchange. Or if I reverse that reaction, the energy exchange will reverse. So if I know a chemical re equation, and I know the enthalpy, or heat energy exchange between the system and the surrounding for that equation, <coughs> I can then also add that equation to other equations, and the enthalpy changes associated with those will also be additive. So this example demonstrates that, and we talked about this specific example last time as well. So in this particular case, if I go from methane and oxygen, that takes a little energy to break the bonds, but then when I form new, stronger bonds, extra energy is released. This is the quantity, and I know it's released because of the negative sign. That means the methane and oxygen are higher in potential energy, less stable, And if I were to convert them, the net energy change would be a release of that specific quantity of energy. So Hess's law basically just says, <clears throat> if I start with these reactants and I release this quantity of energy in making these products, well, what if I were, what if I didn't go directly to those products, but I formed some other set of products first as an intermediate and then went to those products? What would the total energy be, change be in that case? Well, it would be the same. So what it's basically saying is it doesn't matter how I get somewhere, eventually when I get there, the total energy exchange with the surroundings will be the same as it would if I went there directly in one step versus if I went there in multiple steps. So to illustrate that, we can show that quantity of energy in one step, but instead, uh, if I went from the CH4 gas plus O2 gas and produced CO2 gas and H2O as a gas instead of as a liquid, what would the energy be for that? Well, I can calculate that based on Hess's law, which basically says this is the total energy change, but I can also recognize that as the sum of individual steps as well. So in this case, if I add two reactions together and the reactions sum up to this overall reaction, then the delta H for that reaction will be the sum of the individual delta H for the other reactions that I'm adding together. So if I add these two reactions, just like in a mathematical equation, if I have five on one side of equal sign and five on the other side, they cancel out. Here I've got two water liquid on one side and two water liquid on the other side. So they cancel. And so what's left over here is this new reaction. And so when I add two equations together and cancel anything that is found on both sides, the delta H for the new equation will be the sum of the individual equations. So I add these two numbers together. And that would give me the new delta H. So that's basically what we're saying here. <clears throat> I recognize that going from liquid to gas requires, just for the water, from liquid to gas requires a certain amount of energy to be put in because there I have to break some attractions. So if I went from, so that's why it's a positive sign. So if I wanted to go from here to here, that's going to be the sum of this positive 88.0 minus the negative 89.4. So I can think about that graphically, and, rec and that helps me recognize that this quantity for this reaction 
is going to be the difference between these two and it's going to be negative because it's still mostly releasing energy. And I can also look at that mathematically and do what exactly what we said. Since these two cancel out, if I add these together, I get this number and that represents the quantity uh, or of enthalpy change for the reaction if the water's in the gas state instead of the liquid state. And so Hess's law is very useful. It allows me to predict very accurately what an enthalpy change will be for reaction, even if I haven't measured it. If I've measured the enthalpy changes for other reactions that when added together give me this new reaction, I can get the enthalpy change for that new reaction without having to actually do any experimentation, which saves me a lot of time and effort. <coughs> so, when you're applying Hess's law, you just have to remember what we talked about in terms of the treating uh, reactions and the enthalpies associated with them. And that is, you can manipulate these equations. You can multiply, well it's down here, you can multiply all the coefficients by some factor. If you do, you have to multiply delta H for that reaction by the same factor. You have to keep track of the physical states because as we said, if it's a gas versus a liquid, it doesn't have the same enthalpy associated with it. And if you flip a reaction, it, the flipped version where the reactants become the products and the products become reactants will have the same magnitude of the value for delta H, but you have to switch the sign. The sign will be the opposite. And then you can add reactions together, cancel anything that's on both sides, and the sum of those reactions, the delta H, will be um, equal to the sum of the delta H's for the reaction. So here's another example. So here we have this equation here. We want to know what is delta H for this reaction? Well, we, we could look these up in tables or in text or hand, uh, handbooks and we could use these other reactions that are known to figure out the delta H for this reaction if we don't know what it is. Right? So the way to do that is to add these reactions together in a way that cancels everything except these three things and puts the NO and O on the reactive side and the NO2 on the product side. If we can add these reactions together in a way that will do that, then we just have to add the delta H's that are associated with them to get that delta H for the, the sum of those reactions. So I would look at the reactions I have. I notice that this reaction has an NO on the reaction side and that's what I want. So maybe I start with that. So I'd start with reaction one. Put the NO gas plus O3 gas, producing NO2 gas, NO2 gas. So I'd start with that, and that has a del delta H. I didn't do anything to it, I'm just recopying it down because I'm going to add these other reactions to it. So I also have this O, which is not the same as O2 or O3. The only place that appears in my given reactions is right here. <clears throat> but since I want that on my reactant side, but here it's on the product side, I've got to take this reaction and swap the reactants and the products, and then I rewrite it. So I want the 2O on this side, and I want the O2 on the other side. And so if I flip if I swap the reactants and products, that's going to change the sign. So the delta H associated with that is negative 495 kilojoules per mole. And then I want NO2 on the product side. I've got that already here, so I don't need to do anything. I just need to make sure everything else cancels out. Right? So these are the things that I want. I want the O2 and the O3 to cancel. So that's why I need this reaction. So I want to also flip this reaction because I want the O3 to cancel out. Right now I've got it on the reactant side. I need it to cancel so I need O3 also on the product side because they'll only cancel if they're on both sides. So if I flip this reaction, I'll put the O3 on the product side and the three halves O2 on the reactant side. And the delta G associated with that, or delta H associated with that is 
a positive 143.2, uh, 142.3 kilojoules per mole, and I make that positive because since I flip the reaction, I have to change the sign. So does everything cancel? Not quite, because, well, the O3 cancels, so that's good. I don't have to worry about that anymore. <coughs> but one of my problems is, in this balanced reaction, the coefficient is supposed to be a 1 here. But I've got a 2. So what can I do to change that? Well, I need to divide everything here by 2 on both sides. And when I do, that means this will also have to be divided by 2. If I divide or multiply some uh, factor through all my coefficients in the balanced reaction, I have to divide or multiply the delta H by the same factor. So when I take 2 divided by 2, that's going to cancel and that's going to be equal to 1. And then on the right side I have 1 half which is exactly what I need because now on the right side I have a total of 102 plus another half and that is the same as three halves. One and a half O2 on, on both sides so it canceled. And now I only left with the things I wanted so the net equation here is NO gas plus O gas produces NO2 gas and the delta H associated with that will be the sum of these. So I would take a negative 198.9 and then I would add to that a negative 495 divided by 2 and then I would add to that 142.3 and since I'm adding and subtracting I line up the decimal places and I realized I don't have a sig fig past the decimal place of that number, so I can't have a sig fig past the decimal place of my answer, so I end up with negative 304 kilojoules per mole. Questions about that? Assuming that I put it in my calculator correctly, that seems about right. So I encourage you to do lots of examples like that. There will be something like that uh, on the exam. Um, there's also something called enthalpy or heat of formation. So delta H for a reaction generally is just some generic whatever reaction, any reaction. The energy exchange between the reaction and the surroundings is what delta H is. Delta HF is specific for a very specific type of reaction, a reaction where you're forming a compound, so the F stands for formation, you're forming a compound from the elements that make it up in their standard states. So the elements, so for example, if I'm going to form CO2, that's a compound that combines oxygen and carbon. The elements that make that up are carbon, carbon standard state is in the form of graphite, oxygen standard state is in the, a molecule of O2, in the gas phase. So if I took this at one atmosphere of pressure and I added to this solid and I allowed them to come together to form CO2 so again these are thermodynamic quantities that's what this chapter is about. It has nothing to do with how fast the process occurs. That's something you talk about next semester in Gen Chem 2 if you take that. But we're just interested we're not saying this is going to happen fast. We're just saying if we gave it enough time for the oxygen at this uh, pressure and for the to react with the graphite to make one mole of the product, this would be the energy exchange with the surrounding. Right. So it's like any other delta H measures the heat exchange with the surroundings, but it just happens to be for forming one mole of a substance from the elements that make it up. What is delta H of formation for? O2 gas. Delta H of formation is for forming a compound from the individual elements that make it up. 
if something is already an element in its standard state, it's already in that state. It doesn't take energy energy to form it into that state. It's already there. So the enthalpy of, the enthalpy of formation for elements that are already in their standard states is zero. What would be the enthalpy of formation for oxygen as a liquid? Well, that would depend because that is not the standard state for oxygen. So it would depend on if I were to make oxygen as a liquid from the element that makes it up, which is oxygen, in its standard state, which is a gas, I would need to know how much energy or heat enthalpy the reaction exchanges with the surroundings to do that process. <laughs> would that be negative or positive? To go from a gas to a liquid, am I forming attractions or breaking attractions? Forming attractions, anytime I form attractions, it's always exothermic, I always release energy. So this quantity would be negative, I just don't know what it is. I would have to look that up or do an experiment if I wanted to find out how much energy that exchanges with the surrounding to go from a gas to a liquid. But if it's already in its standard state, delta H of formation for that substance is zero because it's already formed. So the standard state means specifically that if it's a solution, it's one mole per liter. If it's a, um, a gas, it's one atmosphere of pressure. And so if I have an element that's already in its standard state, it's zero. And we can also look this up for many substances, which allows us to use them in calculation. So that's the point. The point of heat of formation is it's a number that I can use. I can usually look those up and use them in calculation. So let's look at how those calculations work. So if I have a generic reaction, reactant A plus B reacting to produce C and D, I can use this formula, which is the same as this formula, either form, uh, I think the, the bottom form probably looks less confusing to most people, so that's the one I generally focus on. <coughs> but if I have a heat of formation, if I know the heat of formation for all my products, I can add those together. So this means sum. I just add up all the heat of formation for the products, and I subtract from that the sum of or the all the heat of reactions of the reactants added together. So these are heats of formation. So I would look those up. How much heat is exchanged with the surroundings when the products are formed? versus how much heat is exchanged with the surroundings when the reactants are formed, that comparison will tell me the heat of reaction for any reaction that I want. And I have to also include the stoichiometric coefficients, which we'll see how that works here on um, the example. So this is just the formula. It's on the formula sheet. You can use it to solve problems like this one. So in this example, I've got this reaction. I've got my product. I've got my reactants. And so if I want to know what is delta H for the reaction, that's going to be equal to the sum of all the heats of formation for the products minus the sum of all the heats of formation for the reactant. So I have to look those up or they have to be given to me and they're here. So we have them all respectively here. So the product is the AgCl, and that is the third one, so that's this one. So that's a negative 127.0 kilojoules per mole of AgCl. Heats of formations are per mole of substance, which is different from heats of reactions, which are per mole of reaction. So this is per mole of substance. It just so happens that the reaction it produces one mole of that substance. So I only need to multiply that by one mole of AgCl per mole of reaction. Right? If I do the reaction a mole of times, it, produce, it produces one mole of AgCl. That's an important step because if I forget that step and the coefficients weren't one, then I would not get the correct answer. So I need that step to cancel this unit because in the end, my delta H for reaction is going to have units of kilojoules per mole of reaction, not per mole of substance. 
So that's my product. And then I would subtract from that the sum of all the heats of reaction, uh, heats of formation for my reactants. So I've got the silver, which has a positive 105.9 kilojoules per mole of silver ion. And the reaction involved one mole of silver ion per mole of reaction. And then I'm going to add that to the other reactant, which is the Cl minus. And that one is negative. 167.2 kilojoules per mole of Cl minus, and I ran that space, but that's going to be one mole of Cl minus per mole of reaction. So all the moles of substance cancel, and I get kilojoules per mole of reaction. If I'm going to add and subtract numbers, they have to have the same units or I can't do it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. So they do because all the moles of substance cancel. Everything is kilojoules per mole of reaction, so then I can just add together. I've got a negative 127 minus the sum of 105.9 minus 167.2, close parenthesis, and I get negative 65.7 kilojoules per mole of reaction. So by looking up the heats of formation for the individual substances involved in my reaction, I can determine if I would actually do this reaction, how much heat would be exchanged with the surroundings per mole of reaction without having to do any experimentation. Questions about that? <clears throat> okay, so here's another example. This is a Hess's Law example that also involves some heats of formation. So in this example, here I want to calculate the enthalpy of formation for acetylene. So the enthalpy of formation for acetylene, I would probably not give you the reaction. If I say calculate the enthalpy of formation, I would expect you to know what the reaction for that is because if I'm forming a compound, that means it's going to involve the elements in their normal, natural, standard states coming together to form the compound and then you've got to balance that reaction. So this is the reaction. If I can calculate delta H for this specific reaction, it happens to be a heat of formation because that is a formation reaction for the formation of a specific compound from the elements that make it up. So, that's the reaction I'm interested in. If I have these reactions, I can use Hess's Law to add those reactions together, manipulate them, and then add them together until they come up uh, to equaling that overall reaction that I actually want to calculate. So, I want to get graphite on the reactant side. I've got that here. But the coefficient is only 1. So, if I multiply this by 2, I have to also multiply the value for delta H by 2. But if I do that, I'll have 2 carbon. I'll just put GR for graphite, plus 2O2, producing 2CO2, and the delta H for that reaction is going to be, I'll just write it, negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole of reaction times 2. Okay, if I multiply the coefficients by a number, I have to multiply delta H by the same number. The reason I did that is because I want in my overall reaction to have two carbons and so I have to multiply when I only have one I have to multiply that by two. I also want H2 on the reactant side so I would take the reaction that has that it happens already have it on the reaction side so I don't have to flip it so then I would write H2 plus one half O2 producing water. I should also be including the state of matter because that could be an issue um, it's probably not here um, my hand is tired of writing, so I'm going to just not write those in. <coughs> so that gives me delta H, a reaction of negative 285.5 kilojoules per mole of reaction. I didn't really do anything. I just copied it down. Why did I copy it down? Because I want hydrogen to be on the reactant side. My product is the acetylene. So the reaction that involves acetylene, I need that on the product side. 
Here I've got it on the reactant side and I have the wrong coefficient. So for this third reaction here, for number three, I've got to divide that by two and flip it to get the acetylene on the right side. So if I divide everything by two, I'm going to have two CO2 plus one water producing one acetylene and five halves oxygen and the delta H for that will be half of what it would have been with the double the coefficient so that's going to be negative 2598.8 kilojoules per mole divided by two. So now I want to look to make sure everything else cancels. So I've got the acetylene, that's good. I've got the hydrogen with the right coefficient. I've got the graphite with the right coefficient. Everything else better cancel out. So I've got one water on both sides, that cancels. I've got two CO2 on both sides, that cancels. I've got two and a half oxygens here and two and a half oxygens here. So everything cancels. It should work out if I do it. If I set up all, if I put all the stuff I need in there, everything else should work out to cancel. So then the overall reaction, which is written here, would have a delta H that would be the sum of these individual reactions, delta H's. So I would do negative 393.5 divided by 2 plus a negative 285.5 plus, oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, this should, yeah, that should be positive because I flipped the reaction. Got a little ahead of myself there. Everything else looks good now. Okay, yeah, good. All right, so that's negative 285.5 plus a 2598.8 divided by 2. And so that should give me 817. I've got information, only one digit past the decimal, so 0.2 kilojoules per mole of reaction. And that also happens to be a delta HF because that reaction that I got is the formation of acetylene. Questions about that one? Right, so if you flip the reaction, you've got to change the sign. If you multiply the reaction by a coefficient, you multiply delta H by the same coefficient. If you divide a reaction by a certain coefficient, you have to divide delta H by the same coefficient. And as long as everything cancels, you add the delta H's together in the end. 